Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our second ever edition of our new Civil Beat Ideas Live weekly talk show in which we talk with different thought leaders across the islands on issues of significance to all of us here in Hawaii. Last week, we kicked it off with agriculture, and this week, I am so happy to be able to say that we have with us two leaders in the field of healthcare in Hawaii, Dr. Stephen Kemble and Dr. Seiji Yamada. And Dr. Kemble uh, and Dr. Yamada have both written essays for us in the ideas section. Dr. Kemble wrote um, a piece that was entitled, Hawaii was creating a plan for universal healthcare, it's time to return to it, which appeared on October 4th. And Dr. Yamada wrote a piece for us called, let's call COVID-19 a syndemic, which appeared on October 25th. And you can find both of their essays on our website, but I'm very glad and grateful to have them here today. And just a note about our format, we'll go for about probably 45 minutes to an hour. And you are welcome to send us comments and questions. We're live through our Facebook page. So you can post those and we will see them and we will get to them in the course of our conversation here. But I wanna start out today by asking both Dr. Kemble and Dr. Yamada to just tell us a little bit about themselves, about their practice as medical doctors, and then also about the ways in which they are connected with thinking about healthcare as a, as a, as from a systemic standpoint, because I know both of them are very passionate about the ways that they feel that our healthcare system does and does not work. And that is absolutely something that we will be talking about today and looking at healthcare systems here in Hawaii and then at the national level in the United States and also at the international level and looking at other healthcare systems around the world. So Dr. Kemble, do you wanna start by telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I'm Dr. Stephen Kemble. I uh, went to medical school at UH for two years and finished at Harvard. And I trained in both internal medicine and psychiatry. And I've been practicing as a psychiatrist part-time in a primary care clinic and part-time in private practice. Although I retired from private practice about three years ago, but I'm still working in the, uh, in the clinic serving mostly Medicaid populations. I've been interested in health policy for decades. I've been a member of Physicians for a National Health Program since 1989, and I'm currently on their national board. And I was also appointed to the Hawaii Health Authority, which is supposed to, according to Hawaii law, design a universal healthcare system for Hawaii covering all residents of the state. Uh, and we met actively for a couple of years in 2011 to 2013. But at that point, uh, Governor Abercrombie made it clear that they weren't going to listen to anything we said and we, and we got sidelined. But anyway, that really got me into the forefront of trying to think about health policy. Okay, and um, Dr. Yamada? Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Seiji Yamada. I'm originally from Hiroshima, so I'm something of a, a peacenik. I uh, trained in family medicine uh, in Chicago and uh, worked in uh, Saipan in the Western Pacific before coming to Hawaii uh, in 1994. And I currently uh, teach uh, medical students, uh, family medicine residents, and I also work uh, part-time in a practice in, in, with uh, uh, primary care clinics of Hawaii uh, in Waipahu and um, uh, recently have um, uh, become the director, medical director of, of a uh, federally qualified health center uh, on a neighbor island. Okay, all right. Well, thank you both. And, you know, as the um, thinking about how to begin our discussion today, I thought that one of the things that would be really valuable would be to look at how, how we have come to have the healthcare system that we have in the United States. I think one of the things that we recognize when we look around the world is that we see that many other Western style democracies have national healthcare programs, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and we do not. And it's been a real um, source of debate in this country. Um, and I, I think maybe Dr. Kemble, if we could start by you, if you could just explain for us um, 
how how we have come to be to have the healthcare system that we do in the United States? Well, um, I think the most countries did not have an organized healthcare system in the 19th century, and uh, I think starting with Germany and Bismarck around the turn of the 20th century, um, they developed a national program that covered everyone. Um, England, uh, I think they put theirs together around World War II. And during World, World War II in the US, uh, there was a uh, you know, severe shortage of labor. And uh, so everything got organized um, to, to accommodate for that fact. And one of the things that labor fought for at that time was uh, healthcare coverage for union membership. And, and the, the results of that is healthcare in this country got tied to employment, which did not happen in any other country. Uh, so we ended up with an employment-based system. In the 60s, they passed laws to create Medicare and Medicaid, which covered um, the elderly and uh, the poor. And those were directly federally funded programs. Uh, Medicaid is joint federal and state funding administered by the states and Medicare is a straightforward government payer directly to the providers of care. But uh, both of those programs, Medicare and Medicaid, have been co-opted by private insurance companies who were set up as competing Medicare Advantage plans in Medicare and competing Medicaid managed care organizations in Medicaid. And I think what happened is that the um, health insurance industry noticed that there was a huge amount of money flowing through government and healthcare, and they wanted uh, to be able to tap into that. So they persuaded government, both national and state level, that by contracting healthcare to them, they could make the state or the federal budget more predictable, and they promised that they would be able to make care more cost-effective because they would be able to manage it by reining in unnecessary care. Uh, they blame doctors being paid with fee for service for over, you know, doing too many services because they get paid more by providing more services, which was, as far as I'm concerned, it was largely, not 100%, but largely a lie, but they use that to persuade government to hire them to manage healthcare. And ever since then, we've had a largely corporatized healthcare system, which has brought us to where we are now. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Dr. Yamada? Uh, well, I certainly agree with, with uh, Dr. Dr. Campbell's um, recounting of the history. But uh, so what, what has, what in the end, uh, we've, we've ended up uh, treating healthcare as a commodity uh, rather than a social good or a human right, uh, such that um, uh, there are various entities that are uh, able to make a profit off of the fact that, that um, uh, healthcare uh, eats up 19% uh, of our gross domestic product. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of money that um, uh, is, gets, uh, flows around and um, uh, various entities such as insurance corporations and big pharma are uh, making uh, a large amount of money off of this. And so uh, <clears throat> there's, I think Dr. Campbell and I would, would like to see some of this reversed, uh, that, that uh, uh, we start treating uh, healthcare as a social good or as a human right. And, um, uh, you know, what one thing that we've seen this year is the, the utter folly of tying uh, health insurance to one's employment, uh, given that uh, Hawaii has the highest unemployment rate uh, in the nation now, uh, and it was uh, um, people were out of work uh, even at, at higher rates uh, earlier dur during lockdowns and such. Uh, it just goes to show that um, uh, it's silly to to uh, tie health coverage health coverage to your, your employment. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Kemmer, when you were talking about the, the health, you mentioned the health insurance industry. And again, looking, going back to the idea of the history and, and um, Dr. Yamada, you mentioned big pharma. Can, can you begin to, can you give us some sense of 
how the healthcare industry itself it was created and really has evolved. In other words, if we think about, let's say, the, the you know, the, you know, when things were much smaller and people really had, uh, whether it was the beginning of the 20th century, people went to see a doctor. They, they, there really wasn't an industry, so to speak of. We, how have we now arrived uh, in this world where, as you pointed out in your piece, we have had such a massive growth in the number of administrators in the field of healthcare um, that that this has become um, an issue. How did how did we get to having this huge industry in healthcare? Um, uh, that, that's a big question. Um, one thing I want to say as as a little bit of background is what is the nature of insurance? because insurance is a system for managing financial risk. And it's designed for risks that are infrequent, expensive, and unpredictable, you know, like your house burning down or getting into an accident. But the problem is with, with healthcare, a very large amount of the risk is predictable because so many people have pre-existing conditions and social determinants of health and things like that. So if you have competing insurance companies who are supposed to be managing the risk of a big financial cost in healthcare, and they know that a lot of people have predictable high risk, their main incentive is not to provide better care or even less expensive care than the competition. It's to capture the healthy people and avoid the sick people. So the nature of the insurance business model sabotages the goal of healthcare. And how this ever got allowed to happen in the first place It appears Dr. Campbell has frozen. This is, is kind of when you step back and look. Uh, you're okay now, Steve. Okay. You, again, you, fro you froze for a minute, but you're back, thankfully. You were saying how this ever got allowed to happen. It, it's, it's, uh, it's shocking and appalling when you step back and look at it. It never should have been allowed to happen. But, but once uh, the health insurance industry got involved, they set about making sure that they made themselves as indispensable as possible and that they continue to take a cut. And the effort to manage care by insurance companies, again, this is something that when you step back, it doesn't make any sense, but they claim that doctors are not doing the right thing. They're doing unnecessary things. They're motivated by money, but motivated by money is what the insurance companies are. It's not what doctors generally are. <laughs> Doctors are generally motivated by trying to help their patients. So you have these financially driven large organizations that say, okay, we're gonna uh, manipulate doctors by rewarding them and punishing them with financial incentives to make them do what we want them to do. Even though most doctors until recently Oh, this is very frustrating. I'm, I'm just going to comment here that um, right. it's, it's, not, it's not simply uh, in, uh, in the realm of, of healthcare delivery, uh, but um, say, you know, when Jonas, Jonas Saw came up with, with the uh, uh, polio vaccine, uh, he, he refused to, to, to patent it. Uh, he said it, it's something that, that should belong uh, to, to all of humanity. Uh, uh, while we see uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, uh, big big pharma executives, uh, so you know, like Martin Shkreli, uh, you know, buy, get you know, getting rights to the the patents of um, of an of an anti uh, parasitic drug, and and just uh, driving up its cost by by thousands of percent, uh, just just because just because he can. And uh, you know, it, it just becomes a way to, to to make money off of something that that you know again should should belong to humanity uh, and should not be private property. Uh, so, from a from a practical standpoint, how do you think that could be accomplished? I mean, here here we are in the midst of the pandemic, and there is a vast need for vaccinations. Right? It's a huge potential market. 
And so how, how, how should it, this work in your mind, in the ideal, to take the profit incentive out of the creation of drugs? Well, I, yeah, well I, I, I don't know if we've, if it's completely clear, like these, these, uh, you know, the way that the, these um, uh, vaccine, vaccine corporations uh, have, have um, uh, ag agreed uh, to participate in um, uh, warp in the warp speed project to to quickly develop vaccines, but but it's obviously been a a uh, a large uh, sub subsidy by by the the federal government uh, by by our our tax dollars, uh, and so they they should not be allowed to to make a profit off of this, um, and I think similarly with, with um. Uh, the the medications that are that are used for COVID, but um, uh, yeah. So in 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 the end, though, as as far as COVID goes, uh, the fact that uh, people have lost their insurance uh, is is an issue. But um, the way the again the way healthcare is treated as a commodity uh, leads uh, means that um, uh, people cannot take time off when they're sick if if they if they don't. If they don't have, if, if they don't have um, paid sick leave, and then you know a, a person with uh, a, a, f a little bit of sniffles or a little scratchy throat uh, might decide still decide to to take the bus and, and go to go to their essential work, and and um, uh, so this obviously uh, is is a contributor uh, to the to the absolute failure that, that we've seen in, in terms of controlling uh, COVID uh, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Campbell, we're glad to have you back with us. Uh, my computer crashed, but I'm back up now. <laughs> That's great. That's great. The, the point I was leading to is that the idea that an insurance company would know better than your doctor what each individual patient needs and would therefore um, want to manipulate that doctor with financial incentives is absurd on its face. It is inconceivable that some bureaucrat in an insurance company would know better what you need than your own doctor who knows you personally. It's just crazy. That, that was what I was driving at. Okay, okay. Um, we have a, a question that's come in from, from Koa. He says, how do we help the individuals who do not have health insurance, medical insurance, but refuse treatment because of the fear of a large bill after treatment. So, um, and that, that also gets to, I think one of the real issues in healthcare, which is even though healthcare really is a commodity, it's very, very hard to know what we as consumers are going to be faced with when we get our bills, right? And so on the one hand, uh, it, if, if we don't have any insurance, then, um, we are forced to pay for it ourselves. On the other hand, we don't know what we're gonna to have to pay. The, the billing system is insanely complex. Um, about a third of bills that doctors submit get rejected right off the top and you have to resubmit them and submit extra information maybe copies of the medical notes in order to justify it. And most of the time you do eventually get paid, but the frequency with which you have to jump through hoops is shocking to anyone who has not been in medical billing. It's extremely widespread. There's an entire industry devoted to helping doctors and hospitals get paid for what they do because the process of putting in a bill and getting paid for it is anything but straightforward. It's extremely complex. I've always said with medical billing, there are reverse economies of scale. The bigger the organization, the more likely it is that the people in the billing department will let something complicated or messed up go. They'll leave it in a pile in the corner of the desk. And the most efficient claims collection is the doctor's wife, who's highly motivated to track down every single bill and, and try to get it resolved. Mm -hmm. But with regard to the question of... Uh... The, the person that, that's uninsured and um, uh, reluctant to, to go uh, seek medical care uh, because of that. Well, we, we see that all the time. 
Uh, so you know when you when you take when you take away people's insurance, uh, you're you're going to that you know that that they have uh, an incentive not not to go seek medical care and and so um, you know what what's what's gone on uh, with regard to uh, the our our um, neighbors uh, from the the uh, Micronesia, the, the the nations in in with compacts of, of free asso association, uh, they they were allowed to participate in Medicaid uh, through the, the early two, 20, 2010s. Uh, but um, uh, during the last uh, economic crisis, it was uh, under the the Lingle administration that they. There was first an attempt to, to take away their participation uh, in Medicaid, and uh, it continued uh, through the Abercrombie ad administration. And so uh, they were, were kicked off of Medicaid uh, in 2015. But many of them actually are really are poor, um, uh, such that they, they can't afford uh, the copays uh, attached to, to say, uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare coverage, uh, even even though even though their the pre their premiums might be subsidized by the state, and so and it's also very difficult to remain on the Affordable Care Act uh, coverage, um, which you know you have to renew and, and such, and so uh, people that don't seek care they they get sicker and sicker uh, until they finally have to go to the emergency department. Uh, and they're a lot sicker by then. Uh, they need to be hospitalized. And in the end, um, it uh, uh, ends up that, that not only are they more sick, they, they actually cost more uh, to the, the system and to society uh, overall. And um, so it, it just goes to show that, that um, denying uh, proper primary care uh, is, is not cost effective. There's a couple of examples of what's happened with Medicaid that illustrate that point. Um, when Hawaii, Hawaii used to pay for Medicaid directly through the state, directly to providers of care, and um, they converted the general assistance and aid for dependent children categories to managed care, funding it through managed care corporations in 1994. And they converted the aged, blind, disabled category, which has all the people that have qualified for social security disability, which is many people with serious chronic illnesses, including psychiatric illness. They did that in 2009. When Hawaii had state-run fee-for-service Medicaid, almost all psychiatrists in Hawaii took some Medicaid. When they converted that aged, blind, disabled category to managed care in 2009, almost all the psychiatrists stopped taking new patients with Medicaid. And between 2009 and 2013, access to care went from good to poor and our mental health emergency room and hospital costs shot up 30% in those four years. And this was all over the Star Advertiser in 2013 of what had happened since they converted aged, blind, disabled to, to Medicaid managed care. The other side of it is the state of Connecticut which contracted their Medicaid program to managed care companies in 2000. And in 2012, they, um, uh, there was a bunch of people that had been working on this behind the scenes for a long time. They were showing that the managed care companies were actually blocking access to care. They weren't saving money. They weren't doing any of the things they said they were doing. And they persuaded the Connecticut legislature and administration to fire the managed care companies and take Medicaid back as a state-run program that paid doctors and hospitals directly. And they increased primary care pay to Medicare rates. And they also implemented community programs to help with complicated high-risk patients, the ones that had uh, illnesses that could lead them in easily back into the emergency room or the hospital and provide extra services to manage them in the home or the ones that were in and out of the emergency room a lot. They provide case management assistance with their social problems, things like that. So they, they improved primary care pay and added extra services to, to augment the ability of primary care doctors to actually make sure their patients got the care that they needed. Six years later, physician participation had improved markedly. Um, 
emergency room use for the Medicaid population had dropped 25%, hospitalizations had dropped 6%, and the overall cost of the Medicaid program had dropped by 14%. The four years before they fired the managed care companies, Medicaid per capita costs had gone up 45%. The six years after they dropped 14%. That is a huge difference and it shows what you can do by getting the middleman out of the picture and trusting doctors to take care of the patients the way they're trained to do. So let me ask you then, so, I mean, what do the managed care companies say to something like that? Because the way you present it is pretty irrefutable. Things are gonna get better if managed care companies disappear, right? That's, that's so- They say, they say? They say to the uh, administration, and, you know, the government, state government, or to the uh, legislature, that they are going to make their Medicaid budget predictable and they're gonna save money by reining in unnecessary care and coordinating care and making sure care is proper. They actually have no idea how to do that, but they claim that they do. Once the state contracts their Medicaid money to the managed care organizations, the state expects the managed care organizations to do what they're supposed to do according to their contracts. And they tell the state that they are doing what the contract is. The state of Hawaii was required to do uh, regular um, external reviews, have some outside contractor come in and look at the effectiveness of the Medicaid program. And um, I tracked these in the years after they converted uh, Medicaid to managed care after 2009. And every year the reports came in abysmal. They showed terrible access to care, widespread unhappiness by both doctors and patients through the managed care plans, but the state did nothing about it. They said, well, it's out of our hands now. We've turned it over to them and they claim they're helping us. They claim they're saving us money. They claim all these things, but there's, it's an echo chamber. They have no, no actual intent to, to look at it seriously because it's a convenience to them now that they've contracted it out. What they did in, in Connecticut is they really convinced them that not only were the managed care companies lying to them, they were wasting their money. And when they got rid of them, it turned out that was exactly right. They were wasting their money and they saved a ton of money by kicking them out. I wish Hawaii would do the same. Okay. Um, we could go a lot of different directions from there, but I, but I, we have a question that's come in from, from Sumi and I think she's really sort of pulling way back. And her question is, how do we get from here, from where we are to universal coverage? And that seems to be you know, the real question for a lot of people. And whether they define it as universal coverage, I think ultimately what we're talking about is a healthcare system that is more humane and that works, that just, that works more effectively for our population in the way that we have an, ideally we want an education system that works, we want a criminal justice system that works, we want a national defense system that works, and um, we want a, a healthcare system that works so that we're not in the sort of situation where you were talking about Dr. Yamato, where primary care, preventative care, is just not available to people. So they get sicker and sicker, and at the end of the day, it costs more. So I guess that there are two parts, how, how we get from here to universal care coverage. And then also, I think it would be great if, if you could maybe speak a little bit to what universal coverage looks like in other countries. So that for our viewers, maybe they have a, a kind of a more practical idea of what it's like if you have to participate in the healthcare system in, in countries that have a national healthcare system. If I may take a brief crack at this, uh, I, I think obviously we need to uh, support uh, something like Medicare for all. And um, I know sometimes Steve and I have, have some difference about this, but um, you know, I, I think we, sh we, should, we should just have a, a single payer system where the government, uh, and it's easiest if it's the federal government, uh, handles all healthcare costs the way that they do uh, in, say, uh, National Health Service in in, in um, uh, the the UK, uh, but they actually also employ all their physicians. Uh, while in Canada, uh, you have a system where 
uh, each province uh, has has its um, uh, single payer system again, where they they are the ones that 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 fund that that the uh, all the doctors and hospitals uh, send send the bill to. Uh, so we, you know, the the way the way it is now, uh, you know, just for us to prescribe uh, any any uh, fa med medicine fancier uh, than than uh, and than an aspirin uh, requires us that that we look through uh, you know a, a massive formulary lists and um, uh, ask for prior authorization uh, for this or that and and um, uh, and end up and so we we've ended up again with the situ situation where when you go see your 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 doctor uh, the doctor has uh, his or her eyes glued to the screen, uh, answering uh, these these silly uh, questions about um, uh, how many uh, how many caffeinated drinks have you had today, uh, and, and such. Steve, I'm, I'm sure you have more to say. Yeah. Um, let's see, what was the question again? <laughs> That, well, Tumi's question is basically this is this very large question. You know what you've described uh, is not a model of efficiency or or uh, or particularly humane, right? So she's saying, how do we get from here to universal coverage? And I think okay. I was saying, you know, can can we talk about that? And then also, can we give the viewers some sort of idea of what universal coverage actually looks like in places where you would say it's working? Okay, to get to universal coverage, if you try to take what we have now and fill in the gaps, which is basically what the Affordable Care Act attempted to do, what you find or what the United States has found is that it does help get people more coverage, but it also adds to the cost of health care because adding other plans to fill in the gaps doesn't give you any administrative savings. If you want to both expand coverage to everybody and save money at the same time, you have to get rid of the middleman. You have to demonize the insurance company and persuade government to kick them out in spite of their massive lobbying and all the money that they command and all the uh, campaign contributions they do. You have to persuade government that they are toxic to healthcare and they are the biggest cause of excessive costs that we have. And if we don't do something about that, we just end up adding costs without solving the problem. So you have to get rid of the middleman in order to actually get to a cost-effective universal system. Now, uh, in Canada, yeah, your other part of the question is what happens in other countries? In Canada, if you're sick, you see the doctor, you have no co-pays and no deductibles and no patient cost sharing. And uh, for urgent conditions, uh, you can always get in. Uh, for elective conditions like sur elective surgery, sometimes there's a wait, but in the US there's typically a wait also. And there's really no good evidence that it's any worse in Canada than this country. Plus in the US, your wait is forever if you don't have insurance or can't afford the copay or the deductible. So um, you just go to the doctor, you get the care you need and you don't get a bill. And everybody's covered for everything. And, if, and they spend half what we do on healthcare. Yeah, so that, and that goes to your point about streamlining. So that leads into the question that I, I wanted to ask. Have you ever seen any statistics? If you take, let's say $1 spent on healthcare, what percentage of that dollar is being spent on uh, administrative costs versus going to actual medical professionals and yeah. cost of care? Yes. In, in um, there's a study that was done 15 years ago that found that the answer is we spend about 31 cents out of the healthcare dollar on administration in this country. And Canada spends about 15% cents out of the healthcare dollar on administration. However, Canada failed to include drug coverage in their single payer system. So they have private plans for drug co coverage. And most of that 15% goes to the drug plans. If they had a full single payer system that included drug coverage, it would be more like three or 4% going to administration. Okay. Now, so, and, and one thing I'm curious about, so that was 15 years ago. So we've seen real changes in the healthcare picture since then, uh, right? So can you talk about, I mean, we've seen the, the institution of the Affordable Care Act 
And then also from some of the graphs that you included in your essay that you wrote for us, we've seen a, a even larger growth in the size of the administrative part of the healthcare system. Right? Um, so, I, I, so I imagine it's higher than 31 cents now. I'm sure it is. And I, I can bring up that graph in just a sec that illustrates this, but we had a big jump in administrators during the managed care era, era when managed care companies were moving in, the insurance companies were promoting themselves to government and taking everything over as managed care, which happened in the 90s. And then there's another big jump in the last few years because of the reforms promoted by the Affordable Care Act. But let me see if I can pull up that slide for you. Okay, that's great. And then we'll get to some of our questions that are coming in from, from viewers. And then I'd really like to talk also very specifically about Hawaii because um, there are I know Hawaii has, has had its own really interesting history of healthcare, going all the way back to um, Queens Hospital, and then also with the Prepaid Care Act in 1970. So this is an extraordinary slide. Can you tell us what's going on here? The green at the bottom is the growth of physicians since 1970, and the red is the growth of managers uh, working for insurance companies or people dealing with administrative tasks in physicians offices and hospitals as well. So managers have grown over 3000%. And you can see there's a big bump in the middle in the 90s, that's the managed care bump. And then at the very end, there's another bump from the uh, Affordable Care Act reforms, all of which have piled on more administrative costs without improving care. Okay. All right. Um, here, here is a, a question from Brittany. She says, um, can you support physician assistance having more autonomous practice to increase healthcare providers in Hawaii? So that's a kind of a targeted question about what do you both think about um, physician's assistance as a way to perhaps bring the cost down and to give people greater access to care? I'll take a stab at that. I, I think, I really believe in interdisciplinary teams. I think that uh, physician assistants have less than a quarter of the training of a, of a primary care physician. But if they're working in a team with the primary care physician, they can act as an extender of that primary care physician. And if they run into any problems that they are not sure what to do about, maybe haven't seen before, maybe it's something rare, uh, they have the backup of the doctor that they're working with. I am not a fan of lower level practitioners practicing completely independently because they don't necessarily know what they don't know. But working in teams, I think they're a tremendous asset to healthcare delivery. And I think the physician's assistants generally favor that model of working in collaboration with primary care and they don't really want to be practicing independently. Um, it's more mixed with nurse practitioners. But I do think having interdisciplinary teams is really the way to go. Okay. Dr. Yamada, is there anything no. that you'd like no, to add? I, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Campbell about that. Okay. Okay. Here is a question from Dennis. I have a question. Why won't Governor Ige accept a meeting with supports of the Hawaii Health Authority? We are suggesting how the state could stop overpaying hundreds of millions of dollars per year for an insurance system, which is so bad it is causing a physician shortage and pricing many out of access to health care. So in essence, I guess uh, Dennis's question is, um, and I don't know this to be true, but he's contending that governor, his question is, why won't Governor Ige accept a meeting um, which supports the Hawaii Health Authority? And maybe Steve, you're familiar with that firsthand. Well, uh, when the Hawaii Health Authority was meeting regularly, which is 2011 to 2013, we proposed, and I, it's, this is a, something of a compromise, but because we're constrained by federal law, and which we can't change without our acts of Congress, and, uh, and that makes it hard to capture Medicare money and makes it difficult to capture all of the Medicaid money to be, put it together in, in a universal system with one payer. So we propose what's called an all payer system where instead of requiring everything go through one payer, you allow multiple payers, but you regulate them have to offer the same product. So all payers would pay physicians the same fees and in the same way. And if you're a doctor, it means you're 
billing and collections would, be, would become simple and straightforward instead of having to deal with multiple different insurance companies with multiple different rules and multiple different fire authorization policies and all of this. So the idea was to use regulation to standardize the system to make it simple, even though there are multiple payers. And when we proposed this, um, the insurance industry, which has a lot of influence on the legislature because they contribute a lot of money to them, basically said, no, 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 we're not gonna go in that direction. And Abercrombie said, I'm sorry, but we're not going to listen to you. We're going to go with the insurance companies. And ever since then, the Hawaii Health Authority got sidelined. I really think that with the pandemic and with the crash in both employer-based funding and state tax revenues, uh, it's time to push for something that really could make our health system more cost-effective. To get through something like a pandemic, you really need federal backing because the state can't do deficit spending and state revenues have tanked along with employment-based revenues. But if we could get a state-based universal system with some federal backing that would kick in during something like a, a pandemic or an economic downturn, we could put together a much more cost-effective system. And maybe someone will listen over the coming year because of the effects of the pandemic to say, maybe there's a better way to do this more cost-effectively. So uh, Steve, uh, I mean, what, what you're describing as, as far as uh, regulating uh, all insurance companies to really essentially offer the same product uh, sounds to me essentially what, what goes on uh, in Germany. Uh, which does not have like a single payer system, but heavily regulates uh, the, their insurance companies. Uh, do you, and so I, I just want to clarify, are you, are you saying that, that we, sh we should try to go for that now, or we should go for like a single payer uh, Medicare for all now? Well, it isn't just Germany, it's also France, Netherlands, Israel, Japan. There's a bunch of other countries that use multiple payers, but regulate them to offer the same thing, Switzerland. Um, my preference would be for a national program. I think you could get the most, the most cost-effective system is probably a national health insurance like what they have in the United Kingdom where government both funds and uh, owns the delivery system. So they employ the doctors, they own the hospitals and it, it's like the VA, but at a national scale, it's like the VA. Um, Canada has gone something that's more like the way Medicare works, where the government provides the funding, but care delivery is private and independent. I think for the US, I would prefer private and independent. I think it's slightly less cost effective, but it's a very satisfying way to practice medicine. And I think we would uh, do more for physician morale if we did it the Canadian way than the UK way. But either one could work and either one would be far more cost effective than what we're doing now. And, and we have at the state level, at the state level, uh, when you can't capture all the federal money, I would go with an all payer system, which can, based on the experience of countries that do have all payer systems, it would achieve 90% of the uh, cost effectiveness of single payer. Um, it's a slight compromise, but you could do pretty well with it. But if we could capture all the funding sources, I would go with single payer. When you think about the next practical step to try and bring this into being a closer, closer to reality in Hawaii, given everything you've just said about being in the pandemic and what's happening with the economy of the state, what, what are the next steps that you would actually like to see taken? And connected with that, are there ways in which our viewers could, um, can track that, can possibly become involved in that if it's something that they feel motivated to become involved with? What do people do? Sure. There are three things that we would like to see in this next legislative session, three pieces of legislation. One would be to um, have the state and county employees and retirees um, go from what's called the fully insured model where they contract the money through HMSA and Kaiser and maybe other payers uh, to a self-insured model where they pay providers of care directly for services and the state handles insurance risk instead of contracting it out to other companies. So it'd be basically saying, you can get your care wherever you want and we'll pay them directly. Um, I think that if we did this and if we designed a simplified payment system that was cost-effective, 
we could probably save 15% of what the state spends on healthcare for state and county employees and retirees. That's something the state could really use during the pandemic. The second thing I would do is persuade the administration to do what Connecticut did, fire the managed care plans, take Medicaid back as a state-run program. And there again, um, Connecticut saved 14%. Uh, we could do the same. Uh, there's no reason why not, as long as we did it uh, in a way that really was smart. <laughs> I think if we could get either of those to happen, the state would be very uh, well advised to reactivate the Hawaii Health Authority because we could help make sure that those programs that were now funded and run directly by the state were optimally cost effective and were efficient and, and did not have a lot of waste in them. And we would not use some of the complex administrative systems being imposed by HMSA on primary care now. We would do an administratively simple form of fee for service, get rid of a lot of the perverse incentives in the current system and simplify it. And I think we can do that. So that I would like to see the Hawaii Health Authority activated and help the state run Medicaid and state and county employees and retirees. Beyond that, the Hawaii Health Authority could help us move toward a single payer, all payer system. But those are the things we should do immediately. The third thing I would like to see is that um, the, there's a bill that's been introduced to allow physicians to collectively negotiate with dominant insurance companies like HMSA on how they are paid and how much they are paid. And the reason for doing this is because right now HMSA has complete unilateral control over how doctors are paid. They can dictate whatever they want and nobody can say anything about it. And this is not an openly competitive system. Nobody's negotiating. HMSA is dictating how doctors are getting paid. Alaska had the same situation with a dominant insurer and they got a waiver uh, of the, again, you know, a waiver from the trust, antitrust laws to allow physicians to co collectively negotiate because things are so lopsided. We have exactly the same situation in Hawaii. The same re rationale exists here. We should do it here. That would really help us restore physician morale, give physicians some control in how they are paid and enable us to reverse our dramatic loss of physicians over the last few years. You know, that, that I want to read a comment that someone sent, Thomas sent in, and um, he, this is a description of a, a place in Providence. It's called about the Providence Portland Medical Center, a former Catholic charity, which now has an annual revenue of $14 billion. In the process, Providence has replaced nuns with accountants. Management has been taken out of the hands of doctors and placed in the hands of programmers who seek ways to game the insurance reimbursement rules. So he's saying that he feels that that also accurately describes what's happened to HMSA in Hawaii. Now, I mean, just are there, are there good things to say about HMSA? I think there are a number of people perhaps who feel that uh, um, they like their coverage through HMSA. They're, they're content with their coverage through HMSA. Or, or maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there's nobody who likes HMSA. But what, what, can you help us to better understand the kind of the good, bad, and ugly? Because HMSA certainly, as you say, is the dominant force uh, in healthcare in Hawaii. Well, prior to the Affordable Care Act, I considered HMSA to be one of the better insurance companies nationally. And HMSA had their roots in plantation medicine. And um, when you had plantations who wanted to make sure their employees had some kind of health coverage, uh, the, in, the goal was to make sure people got the care they needed. And HMSA, those are HMSA's roots. And they pretty much followed that up until about a decade ago. And um, they prided themselves on having among the lowest administrative costs in the country. Uh, and because of our prepaid health care act, which has been in place since 1974, we have broad uh, benefits, broader than any other state. We have no deductibles and only 10 or 20% co-pays for people insured through their employer. And uh, we got an exemption to the um, uh, ERISA law, which allows us to have an employer mandate here, which no other state has. 
Um, and that employer mandate has ensured broad coverage, a large percentage of the population has had coverage. HMSA standardized benefits, standardized payment, so it functioned like a quasi single payer system. There were a few other smaller insurance companies. There's uh, you know, things like Medicare and Medicaid, which are outside of that system. But within employer-based healthcare, it was a quasi single payer system. And it was, we had the best benefits uh, and we had the third lowest health insurance premiums in the country with much better benefits than the ones that were lower than us. Mm -hmm. um, we had a generally adequate physician workforce things worked pretty well then. The Affordable Care Act put into law this idea that we need to move away from fee-for-service because doctors are delivering too much services due to, due to fee-for-service, which as I said before is a lie, especially in Hawaii it was a lie. We also had the lowest per capita Medicare spending in the whole country in Hawaii in spite of our high cost of living. So there's never any truth to that here, but they use that as a rationale to say, so we want you to move away from fee-for-service and shift insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals by, if you pay a doctor upfront for the care of a patient or a population of patients, or you pay a doctor and hospital, doctors and a hospital together, a lump sum of money upfront, then the more care they deliver, the less they get to keep, and the less care they get to deliver, the more the money they get to keep. So by shifting insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals, you make the doctors and hospitals into little insurance companies operating under the competitive insurance business model, which I said is the source of so much trouble and makes no sense for healthcare. So HMSA jumped on this bandwagon after the Affordable Care Act passed and they became the first major insurance company in the country to fully capitate primary care practices. They're paying primary care doctors a lump sum per member per month to take care of their patients. The problem is that if you do that, you also have to have some counter incentives to prevent people from skimping on care and avoiding sick people because those are the, those are the built-in incentives. So they added pay for performance, pay for quality, pay for outcomes where you're, you're supposed to submit all these metrics and they give you bonuses or, or, or take money back if you don't meet them or things like that. They're financial carrots and sticks. And they also have risk adjustment where they look at the details of your patients and how sick they are and try to pay you more for sicker people and less for healthier people. Problem with risk adjustment, or both of these require a lot more data. You can't do them without very detailed data. So they demand a lot of data. They demand all practices computerized and they submit all these metrics and that adds to the administrative cost of the practice. And risk adjustment, which is supposed to correct for the factors that the doctor can't control turns out to be grossly inadequate. You know, the best risk adjustment formula captures about 12% of the variability in cost. So that leaves doctors who are capitated with an 88% incentive to avoid sick people and only take healthy people in their practice. And so we've made doctors into little insurance companies and the result is it really aggravates disparities in access to care. And it adds administrative costs. You no, know, and the, the trouble is that that um, uh, again a lot, a lot of, during the pandemic, people a lot of people don't have their uh, private insurance uh, through through uh, through their employers because they're now unemployed. Mm -hmm. But uh, inherently, uh, it's um it's a question of uh, you know kind of who's in and who's who's not. And uh, I I think we we believe that that. It, everybody should be in, and nobody should should be outside of you know beyond the veil where you you don't have health insurance, you don't have the right to to uh, access healthcare. Well, connected with that, here's a comment from Leila, who I think is for both of you. Thank you for your efforts, dedication to your profession, helping humanity, and blessings to you both. So your work is certainly very appreciated, you know, and, and um, Dr. Campbell, I mean, just to hear what you were just saying, you know, I think part of this is, you know, there's such a level of complexity 
just to even try, you know, it just sounds like all these layers of bureaucracy. And you think of the average person who is engaging with the system, the reason they're there is because they're not well. <laughs> you know, so I think this is also, I can imagine as physicians, something that's very difficult to see, you know, as compassionate individuals, you see people who are coming for care. They're coming to ideally find someone who can help them to be healthier, to be better, to find a cure. And um, having to, to negotiate this Byzantine system, uh, you know, we, we, when we talked about what we would talk about today, we, we talked about that perhaps you would each reflect on things that you have seen work, things that you have seen not work so well. But I wonder if you wanna maybe each share with us a, a story of um, an experience of one of your patients uh, caught up in this, in this world of modern day American healthcare? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, I, I've at one point seen a patient at, with end stage renal disease. Uh, he happened to be an immigrant from the Philippines. Uh, he en ended up in the hospital. They, they put a, a vas cath in his neck and, and they dialyzed him uh, and then when uh, he was well enough to, to walk out of the hospital. They took out the Vascaf and Vascaf and, and sent him uh, to the federally qualified health center where uh, obviously we, we don't have the, we didn't have the, the, the capacity to, to do dialysis. And so this, this uh, particular patient uh, just went home uh, to die, uh, went home to the Philippines uh, to die. Uh, so it, it just goes to show what, what what happens when you, you know, deny access to healthcare? Uh, I have, when they um, converted Medicaid to managed care, the managed care companies started imposing a lot of prior authorizations for drugs, and especially for psychiatric drugs because some of their, them are expensive. And um, so now, if you write a prescription, there's about a 25 or 30% chance it's gonna get denied and they're gonna want a prior authorization. And if you submit the paperwork, you can almost always get the prior authorization, but it's a delay of several days and you have to jump through a hoop to get it. I've had, um, I'm thinking of one patient in particular when, when he took his prescription, he had schizophrenia and, and schizophrenics tend to deny that they have an illness and you have to negotiate with them and persuade them to try taking a medicine for something that they don't even believe is actually a disease. So it's, it's a difficult negotiation, but I managed to persuade him to go get this prescription filled and tar, start taking it. He got to the pharmacy and they denied it and said it needed a prior authorization. I didn't see him again for six months. During that period of time, he ended up in the emergency room several times. He got hospitalized and finally referred back to me after his second hospitalization at huge cost to the system, all of which could have been prevented if they just let me prescribe the drug that we had negotiated so painstakingly up front. That, that's craziness. Also, DHS, Medicaid, implemented a rule that if you're on general assistance and you miss your doctor's appointment, they cut you off your benefits because they want to be sure people follow through with care. But we're dealing with a population, many of whom are homeless. They may get their phone stolen out of their backpack when they're sleeping on the street. They don't have a smartphone. They don't have a computer. They're only getting $325 a month to live on plus some food stamps. Uh, and the idea that they're going to be able to make all their appointments you know, conscientiously is unrealistic. So what happens is they, miss an appointment and they get cut off. And I have had multiple patients where I had to talk them out of suicide when that happened and tell them, well, our social worker will work with you to get reinstated. Don't drop out of treatment, please keep seeing me. Uh, and, and I spent all my time trying to undo the damage caused by these system problems that get in the way of care instead of focusing on helping people get better. Okay. Well, thank you both for sharing those stories. And we're, we're almost in an hour. Um, we have, maybe we'll take this as our last question from the viewers. This is another question from Sumi. And I think it's a, you know, it's a great question. Thanks for asking this Sumi, because I think that this is probably something that everyone who has um, 
<laughs> lived in Hawaii and is familiar with all of the systems might be asking. And that question is, why should we believe the state would be any good at managing statewide health insurance? It would depend on who they got to manage it. Um, you know, it, it, I, it, would, it would be tempting for the state to say, uh, we're gonna take back the insurance risk, but we're gonna hire HMSA to manage the health benefits as a third party administrator and let HMSA run away with it. Uh, and there are many states that have made this mistake. This, to get a cost-effective self-managed health insurance program, the state has to hire the expertise to develop a truly cost-effective system. Connecticut did do this with their Medicaid program. The Hawaii Health Authority, if they appoint appropriate people to it, could do that for Hawaii, but you can't just turn it over to the insurance company. That's like hiring the fox to guard the hen house. Okay. Um, we lost Dr. Yamada. I'm not sure um, where he went. Um, I was going to invite you both um, to give us closing thoughts. And um, I'm hoping maybe Dr. Kemble, you could do that. And maybe magically out of the kind of the Zoom, <laughs> Zoom magic, um, Dr. Yamada will, will come back before you're through. Let's cross our fingers. He probably went to the same place in the cloud I went to and I disappeared for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you came back, so hopefully you will too. Well, I would, I would say that um, in dealing with health policy, we really need to focus on administrative simplification and eliminating middlemen because that's where all the excess cost is and that's where all the dysfunction is. If we could get back to trusting doctors to do what they're trained to do, supporting them in doing that, both financially and in term, terms of extra resources to help with difficult problems, we could have a truly cost-effective healthcare system. Hawaii is in a good position to lead in this. We, we already led with the Prepaid Healthcare Act in 1974. Mm -hmm. We are an island, we're separated geographically, so people can't just step across the border like they can in other states we could design a truly cost-effective universal system if only government would develop the will to get it done. We even have in Hawaii law, the Hawaii Health Authority statute is supposed to do exactly this. It's supposed to design a universal cost-effective system covering everyone in the state. It's in law. All we have to do is implement it. We don't even need another bill. It, 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 who down at the legislature, if anyone, is, is supporting you um, we've gotten particular support from John Mizuno, who's the chair of the House Health Committee. And there are a number of others who have expressed interest, uh, but Mizuno has been most actively involved with us in trying to push for this. And he's introduced bills to you know, re reactivate the Hawaii Health Authority, but they didn't get past some other committees which weren't so favorable. But I think the lay of the land in the legislature this session looks a little more favorable and maybe, and plus we have the leverage of the financial catastrophe of COVID-19 uh, to say, we got to get serious about saving some money here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the other piece with COVID-19 is just the human catastrophe of, of, of COVID-19. And I was reading, of course, as, as all of us have been, just even today about the ways in which hospitals across the United States are, are filling up. Um, the unbelievably heroic job that healthcare workers you know, have been doing to care for for people, and of course, you know the the, the extreme um, rates of disease um, and the great suffering that's going on out there. So I think you know I know we've been very focused on policy today, but the news just keeps bringing it back to the the reality of the the suffering that is going on, and and just as Dr. Yamada was talking about, people who are who are sick but just simply don't feel like they they there is any way for them to access care. Yeah. Yep. Um, having having people lose their health insurance because they lost their job and being uninsured and getting sick and having to go to work sick because they're afraid uh, if they do have a job that that uh, and they and they don't go to work sick that they're going to lose their job. Uh, all those things are uh, ideal circumstance for the spread of a highly infectious disease like COVID-19. It's like 
we're playing right into the pandemic with the with the flaws in our healthcare system. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it, it, is there? I, I just want to offer that if for people who are really interested in this. And is there are there any websites or any um, any areas that you would direct people to um, if they want to learn more? Well, Healthcare for All Hawaii has a Facebook page that's run by Dennis Miller and anyone who wants to can join that. That's a, a grassroots single payer advocacy organization. Physicians for a National Health Program is a national physician-based single payer advocacy organization, but anyone can join that too uh, or follow their website. And that's pnhp.org, O-R-G. Uh, so those are two um, great resources. PNHP is also the best source for high quality health policy information. If you want to find articles or, or statistics or things like that, that's the place to go to look for them. You know, I'm curious, how many physicians are in the national PNHP? Um, oh, I don't have the latest numbers off the top of my head. It's, it's growing. Um, uh, there are chapters in most states, including Hawaii, uh, but it's by far, it's nowhere near a majority of physicians. However, if you poll physicians, over half now say they would support a single payer program. Huh, over half of the physicians in the United but States? They haven't necessarily joined PNHP, but over half are now in support of a single payer system. Okay, all right. They're, they're just living with the dysfunction of what we're doing now every day and it's right in their face in a way that it isn't for most of the population. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I want to say great thanks to Dr. Yamada. And I'm, I'm sorry that we, we we're ending without him, but certainly we're very, very glad to have him for the vast majority of the show today. And Dr. Kemble, thank you so much um, for joining us as well and for all of your good work. And maybe we'll do a follow up show um, once the legislature is through and we can talk about what what happened um, and where we are at that point and hopefully there'll be some good news about the pandemic at that point so um, and to all our viewers please join us next week wednesdays at 2 p.m every week we'll be having this show civil beat ideas live so many thanks uh, to all of you and aloha <laughs>